Savior, Jesus Christ. 800 years before Christ, Isaiah the prophet sang a song. Let me sing you a song about my beloved. My beloved planted a vineyard. He planted choice vines. He put a fence around it. He dug a wine press in it. He built a tower for it. And he looked for it to yield good grapes. But it yielded to him only bad. O house of Israel, judge between me and my vineyard. Is there anything that I could have done for my vineyard that I did not do? Then why, when I looked for good grapes, did it yield only bad? <laughs> Isaiah then explains the song about his beloved. His beloved is the Lord of hosts. The vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. The vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the people of Jacob. Several days before our Lord Jesus Christ died, he told a parable. He said, a man planted a vineyard. He put a fence around it. He dug a wine press in it. He built a tower in it, and then he leased it to tenants. He went away. When the time for fruit drew near, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his share of the fruit. The tenants mistreated the slaves and sent them back to the owner of the vineyard empty-handed. The owner of the vineyard sent the tenants more slaves. The slaves, I'm sorry, the tenants beat these slaves and stoned them. Some of them they even killed. The owner of the vineyard said, what shall I do? I will send them my beloved son. Perhaps they will respect him. When, when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. The tenants threw the son out of the vineyard and killed him. Jesus then asked the chief priests and the scribes, what will the owner of the vineyard do to those tenants? The chief priests and the scribes probably owned vineyards of their own. They probably had tenants taking care of their vineyards. The chief priests and the scribes said he will put those wretches to a miserable death, and he will let out the vineyard to others, to a people producing its fruit. Jesus answered the chief priests and the scribes, Have you not read from Isaiah that the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Do you not know that anyone who falls on this stone will be dashed to pieces, and anyone upon whom the stone falls will be crushed? Therefore, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you, and it will be given to a people producing its fruits. It was then that the chief priests and the scribes perceived that he was telling the parable against them. Obviously, they had not read Isaiah. If they had read Isaiah, they would have known that the Lord was telling the parable against them from the very beginning of the parable. They would not have had to have waited for the king of Israel to take the kingdom away from them. You know what the Lord is talking about. Isaiah has sung his song. The vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. The tenants of the house of Israel are those people who are in charge of the people of Israel to care for them. The Son of the Lord of hosts is the Son of God, our Lord Jesus Christ. And the slaves that the owner of the vineyard sends to the tenants are those slaves of the Lord of hosts whom God has sent to Israel prior to sending his Son, Jesus Christ. Who are the slaves of God that he sent unto Israel prior to sending 
with our Lord Jesus Christ. The slaves that God sent unto Israel prior to sending the Lord Jesus to them are the prophets of the Old Testament. Israel mistreated the prophets of the Old Testament. The tenants of Israel who were supposed to care for God's flock mistreated the slaves of God whom God sent to them. They ignored them. They beat them. They treated them shamefully, and some of them they killed. And finally, God sent his son to them. And what did they do to the son? They put him outside the gate and crucified him. Jesus, in this parable, is predicting his own crucifixion yet once again. He is charging the chief priests and scribes with responsibility for how they have treated the prophets and with responsibility with how they are going to treat them. It is only just that God should take the kingdom away from them and give it to a people producing its fruits. Thus far, the only people that Jesus has designated as the people producing the fruits of the kingdom are the tax collectors and the prostitutes who believed John the Baptist and submitted to his baptism. And then Jesus tells the parable of the wedding feast. And from Isaiah and from the parable of the vineyard, you have everything you need to have in order to decode the parable of the wedding feast. A king is throwing a wedding feast for his son. Since the owner of the vineyard has a son, and the owner of the vineyard is God, and the son of the owner of the vineyard is the son of God, it stands to reason that the king who throws the wedding feast is God, and the son of the king is our Lord Jesus Christ. He is throwing a wedding feast for his son. He sends out his slaves to invite those invited to come to the wedding feast which is now ready. The slaves that he sends to those who are previously invited meet the same fate as the slaves of the owner of the vineyard that he sent to the tenants. Therefore, those who are previously invited are those members of the house of Israel to whom God had extended his call to the final salvation. The slaves that God sends out to those who are previously invited are the prophets. What then would be the wedding feast of the son? If the king is throwing a wedding feast for his son, and the son is the Lord Jesus Christ, it stands to reason that the Lord Jesus Christ is getting married. To whom would the Lord Jesus Christ get married? In Ephesians chapter 5, God commands, Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as to the Lord. As the church submits itself to Christ in everything, so also wives shall submit themselves in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to cleanse her through the washing of water and the word to present her to himself without spot or wrinkle, a radiant church without any blemish. This mystery is profound, and God says that he is talking about Christ and his church, but in the same way, husbands ought to love their wives, and the wife shall respect her husband. The one to whom the Son is wed is the church of God. He lays down his life for her. He cleanses her by the washing of water and the word. He presents her to himself without spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. This is the one whom the Son of God marries. And the wedding feast that the Lord describes in this parable is the final salvation. Isaiah prophesies that on the day when the Lord swallows up death forever, he will prepare a feast of the best meats and the finest of wines. The day upon which the Lord swallows up death forever is the day of resurrection. It is the day of the final salvation. Therefore, on the day when the dead rise, the Lord will greet them with a feast of the best meats and of the finest of wines. The wedding feast of the Lamb and his kingdom 
is the final salvation. The book of Revelation describes the final wedding feast and how the bride has prepared herself for that feast by adorning herself with her jewels. The final wedding feast to which God invited Israel was the final salvation. He invited Israel to the final salvation when he sent to Israel his prophets. And what did Israel do? They ignored the prophets. One went to his farm, another to his business. They decided to try to satisfy themselves with meat and drink that does not last. Ignoring the king's invitation, they went to their farm. They went to their business. Ignoring God's invitation to the final salvation, they had more important things to do. Then Israel mistreated the prophets, stoned some of them, harmed others, treated them shamefully. Some of them they killed. And the king was angry, and he sent his troops, and he burned their city. Now what is the city of Israel? The city of Israel is obviously Jerusalem. In this parable, Jesus is predicting that God will send troops against Jerusalem and burn it down. God has already set precedent for doing this in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, he sent his troops, the army of Babylon, against his city and burned it down. In this parable, Jesus predicts that it will happen once again. It will happen because they have ignored the invitation of God on high. They have ignored the invitation to the final salvation. They have mistreated those slaves of God on high who issued the invitation to them. So in AD 70, a Roman general by the name of Titus marched Roman troops on Jerusalem and they burned it to the ground. These were the troops that God sent against their city and burned it to the ground. He did it with full justice because they had ignored his invitation and mistreated the people who brought the invitation to them. Now, the king says, he says to his slaves, go out into the roads and call as many as you may find so that my wedding hall may be filled with guests. So his slaves went out to the roads and invited people to the wedding feast of the king. Who are these slaves? Our Lord told this parable a few days prior to his crucifixion. He told this parable under Roman occupation of Palestine. You don't mention roads under Roman occupation without getting people to think of the Roman roads. The slaves that the king set upon the roads, he set upon the Roman roads. And so if the king is God, what slaves does he send upon the roads to invite people to the final salvation? Those slaves are his apostles. You read the book of Acts. I know that St. Paul traveled by sea, but he also traveled by land. And when he traveled by land, he, together with his other apostles, were traveling on the roads, and they invited as many as they could find, both the good and the bad, so that the wedding hall of the king was filled with guests. They're inviting the Gentiles. The kingdom of heaven has been taken away from the chief priests and the scribes. It has been given to a people producing its fruits. Those are the tax collectors and the prostitutes who listened to John the Baptist, confessed their sins, and submitted to his baptism, and now it, it is the Gentiles. He has given the kingdom of heaven to you. Now don't you wish that Jesus had ended the parable right there? Wouldn't it be nice if Jesus stopped right there and said, in my own name, amen? That would be great. But no, he keeps on talking. And when he keeps on talking, he says something dismaying. After all of these Gentiles enter the wedding hall of the king, the king goes in, look at him. There's a guy there without wedding garments on. Friend, how did you get in here without wedding garments? The man was speechless. The king said, tie him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. 
Now, when the Lord Jesus says, many are called, but few are chosen, he is not inviting a Calvinist Arminian debate. He is not inviting a theological debate amongst us Protestants regarding the divine power and human responsibility. When he says, many are called, but few are chosen, he is saying to you Gentiles that just because the gospel has come to you does not mean that you have some privilege over against Israel who rejected their Messiah. How many times do we read the Old Testament with that kind of attitude? Look at those people. God saves them out of Egypt. He saves them out of slavery. And how do they repay him? They gripe about how he takes care of them in the wilderness. They build a golden calf and they bow down to it. Just look at those people. Can you believe the nerve? He produces water from a rock and manna from heaven and they continue to complain. We read the Old Testament with an air of self-righteousness about us as if we would have been different had we been there. As God warns us in Romans chapter 11, that the people of Israel were cut off because of unbelief, and you Gentiles stand by faith. If God cut off the natural branches of Israel, who had the tabernacle and the temple and the prophets, don't you think he'll cut off you? Therefore you shall fear. Heed what John the Baptist said when the Pharisees and the Sadducees came out to his baptism. He said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not say to me that we have Abraham as our father, for I tell you that God can raise up out of these stones children for Abraham. So you Gentiles have no right to boast against the Jews. You have no right to assume a position of privilege over against them because they have rejected their Messiah and you have accepted him. You must have wedding garments. You must produce fruit in keeping with repentance. You must produce the fruit of the kingdom. And the fruit of the kingdom is confessing your sins and submitting to baptism. To have yourself cleansed by the washing of water through the word so that Jesus may present you to himself a radiant church without a spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Put on the robe of Christ's righteousness that he has procured for you by his death and resurrection, that he has bestowed upon you in the washing of water through the word. Do not boast to me that you are Americans. That you have rights? Do you really think you have rights before the one who rose from the dead? And don't boast to me about your European extractions either. About how German or Scots or Irish you are. Dad says there's a little Dutch in me. But that does no good, does it? Or whatever extraction it is about which you would boast. If you boast in those things, then you are no better than the Pharisees and the Sadducees who boasted that they were the children of Abraham. If you want to sit at table in the kingdom of God, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you must have a robe of righteousness. You must have wedding clothes. You must have jewels with which you have adorned yourself, and that is none other than the righteousness of your Lord Jesus Christ. But well, without that righteousness, he will simply bind us hand and foot and throw us into the outer darkness where there will be weeping 